Uh, next up, we have Varun Kumar and, and Greg Weiss uh, from Cisco, who are going to talk about, well, I'll let them describe it, but they're going to talk about their uh, data architecture and, and what they've been doing. So this is a data platform conversation. Uh, we both work for Cisco. And for the last one and a half, two years, we have been hard at work building a platform uh, that is more in tune with the needs of today for data and analytics. And this conversation is about that. First, let's quickly talk about Cisco a bit before we get into the details of the data platform. Uh, so from, from our perspective, uh, Cisco is a global company. We have operations in North America as well as in Europe, a little bit of Latin America. Uh, we have about close to 37 or different distribution, mega distribution centers uh, in North America and, and, and a lot more outside of that. Overall, uh, as of the last financial year, it was a $58 billion company, uh, which places us around 57 on the Fortune 500. Uh, but that's just a little more financials of the Cisco. Overall, uh, what we really do is our customers are the establishments that prepare food away from home. That will be restaurants, hotels. It could be uh, prisons. Um, and and a whole lot of other things as well. So that's a little more background on Cisco. Now, before I took this role at Cisco, I was a consultant. Uh, I did promise no equations, but I didn't say no two by twos. So this presentation has a two by two. This is the only two by two. This is a consultant view of abstracting the world to whatever uh, works best given the situation. So in this two by two, you'll find uh, on the horizontal x-axis, our approach, which has been reactive to more proactive. And on the y-axis, the different needs that have evolved from an operational management uh, to decision support to data science. When I got here in 2015, we were a fairly operational company. We had close to 250,000 reports. We didn't know what was the utilization on those reports, who was using them, but we used to churn them out day after day using the EDW that we had in our landscape. And then few things started to change for us. The first thing that started to change was the data was growing at a more rapid pace, not transactions. The transactions were incremental 5 to 10%. We had a lot of data being collected from our sensors, on our trucks, on our warehouses that we never had insight on. So we started seeing a lot of that data being missed. In addition to that, there was a lot of data upfront on the consumer demand, um, places like Grubhub, Yelp, uh, LinkedIn. Yes, <laughs> in some cases, uh, we were missing a lot of this data because the data was not really getting or making its way for analysis at all. Third thing we started seeing was a change with respect to how our customers came to our platform. There used to be a, a BI tool kind of a, uh, approach, which our business analysts used to be very comfortable with. Now we, we saw a lot of, lot of notebook-driven access to our platforms. We saw a lot of API-based access to our platforms. And we're really not ready for that kind of a world. At the same time, there was a lot of pull from our business users on partnering to build self-service tools on the data side, also on the visualization side. Uh, suddenly, data became everybody's problem. Everybody was interested in doing something or the other with the data set that is being available. So we had this, this good amount of pull coming from our business teams, which wanted to do a lot more things with the data, um, not just stopping at being uh, ad hoc analysis and other things, but moving forward and trying to do uh, predictions and then prescriptive analytics kind of work, which, which kind of... Uh, uh, runs into things like churn, recommendations, and so on and so forth. So we were building these tools and technologies piecemeal one after the other. And really, we were not scaling it at all for our business needs. That was the other uh, thing that we saw. And finally, the world around us is changing a little more, where we are at a point where we have humans interacting with machines. Out in the future, it's machines versus machines. Uh, the future belongs to voice and vision. Uh, the voice-based tools are 15% more efficient or more faster than what you can type. So there is this need for a platform, if you will, to be able to sustain with different kind of user patterns and the changes that you see. And, and that's why 
we went ahead and invested in, a, in, a, in building a platform from the ground up. The platform that we ended up with is called Seed. Now, this platform is completely in cloud. This is an eye chart, so I'm not going to take every slide and talk through it. Uh, but this platform is completely in cloud. It allows us to do a couple of things. Uh, actually, more than a couple. Uh, it allows us to collect data, store data, process data, as well as analyze data at scale. Now, the other thing that this platform gives us is allows us not to be obsolete. Because this is more of a component-based solution, we can take individual component out of the solution and still be successful towards the goal that we set out to do. I'll let Greg talk more about the technical architecture pieces of this. You know, one of the challenges with migrating to new technology is that um, it's a lot of work and there's not necessarily a lot of business value in it. And so for our migration from our disparate systems into the data lake, a key thing was that we had kind of a mix of a financial and a technical strategy. Financially, what we were able to do was say, we have some equipment, it's coming up for renewal, there's some $1 million licensing to try to renew this, and if we can port this to the cloud and run it for $20,000 a month, we can have a development budget of a million dollars to do all the work to try to migrate from our uh, historical data systems to this new landscape. The second, technically, uh, and it goes a little bit to this slide, you, you have to pick your battles, uh, which things you're going to change from your old system and which, which you're going to keep. And if you can choose efficiently, uh, you don't have as much work and risk in front of you. So this slide, you can see uh, the source systems remain the same. Our ingest system was an Informatica system, which is sort of a best of breed uh, enterprise ETL tool. And we left some of that in place. We brought it from on-premise in, in the cloud, but uh, we were able to sort of uh, put, bring it into the ecosystem. But we were able to introduce new things like this S3 layer. So historically, data has always had to come into our centralized database, right? And that, that's how it would then get exposed to users for analytics. But as, as you're aware, there are all sorts of data in flat files. People want to be able to analyze data that's not necessarily been brought into, into a data warehouse or database form. So this part of this e ecosystem is freeing us up to bring in all sorts of different data sets and make them available for analysis by uh, data scientists and, and, and other an analysts at Cisco. So that's that top S3 layer is, is that flat file system. Um, we were all kept Informatica at points in the compute layer that you'll see in the middle, but we added to it the ability to, for the data sets that involve larger amounts of data, to use Spark and Spark SQL. Um, PySpark, and we were able to get accelerated jobs and be able to sort of scale out some of that compute. So we weren't really bound to the speed of our database so that the database got more and more expensive over time. We could pick a scale out strategy for individual jobs that we wanted to do to manipulate this data. Um, and uh, the other thing, we, we were able to find databases that were relatively similar to ones we'd used before. So our previous data warehouse appliance, Natiza, was fairly Postgres compatible, and we were able to uh, use the Postgres compatibility of Redshift so that many of the consuming tools on the right were able to remain the same, and we were able to sort of deliver this uh, project in, in, a, in a relatively timely manner. Um, but with this ecosystem, we're now enabled to, to do a variety of, uh, use a variety of other tools and, and do a variety of different things. So with, uh, with this ecosystem, in addition to moving data into this data warehouse, we're also bringing data out of the warehouse back into flat files, but this time into structured files that could then be analyzed by data scientists. So part of, part of the ecosystem is not just to have people go to the database anymore, but we have people now who are able to uh, take data out of the, the data, in the database that also exists in our data lake, so that we have uh, parquet uh, files that are relatively performant um, for, uh, anal so, that, so that when data scientists want to spin up to them, we have sort of a scalable <coughs> approach for them to do that. In a data warehouse, the problem is the data warehouse, for example, we've grown our data warehouse from two nodes to four to six to eight to 12, and it gets more and more expensive over time. Um, but if people aren't using it regularly, you're starting to incur a lot of expense that, that 
just grows over time. But by putting the data not just into this uh, database, the data warehouse, but also into S3 Data Lake with the Parquet files, um, we can have data scientists using uh, RStudio, using Jupyter Notebooks, issue kind of Athena queries that are serverless, that don't require us paying for a server up front. The queries run slightly, they don't require the peak performance of a, of a, of a Redshift cluster, but we're able to then serve kind of ad hoc, as needed queries against the, the full set of data that we have. Um, so one of the great things is having migrated from on-premise and these legacy big enterprise data warehouse uh, tools into, into, into the cloud, when you are at Cisco and you need to get some computing project done, you can spin it up in a matter of hours as long as you can get somebody who has some budget to give you some money. It doesn't require provisioning. We don't have to have admins setting things up and going through the kinks of trying to get the connectivity all sorted out. Um, so that's really a great thing about uh, doing that sort of analysis at Cisco. Um, work on real business problems, delivering real value. We have all sorts of uh, problems in terms of sales, uh, trying to optimize what do you let the salesperson get away with in terms of pricing the products? How do we guide and help the salesperson in divide, uh, uh, pricing products uh, while still maintaining margins and, and, and our ability to execute as a business, handle competitive situations? Uh, transportation, right? We have trucks on, uh, in you know, 80 cities in the US going out every day. How do we make sure that we have the right routes to the different locations? Um, and then when there are problems with trucks reaching locations, how do we get some sort of real-time feedback from sensors on those trucks so that we can make decisions to try and make sure that a restaurant in a given location gets the product they need and we uh, can on the fly sort of try to route around issues to, to meet our customers' needs. Um, forecasting, e e even within a warehouse, uh, you know, there's a lot of floor space in the warehouse. Where do you want to put the products as an optimization problem? Where do you put the products in your warehouse to make sure that you have the fastest time to get the product? off of a truck that's coming in with supplies and back onto a truck that's going out to, to the customers. Um, one nice thing about working in a corporate uh, environment with, with data is that, um, you know, data science is sort of the old story and I, I've seen this myself. You spend 70, 80% of your time cleansing the data and 20% of your time doing the analysis. And so that's, that's a part of what our team delivers for Cisco is cleanse data, data that we can validate, data that we've cross-checked against multiple sources uh, to make sure that it, uh, it's, it's worth, you can focus on the analysis and not so much the wrangling. So some of the things we're working on uh, going forward, we've started bringing in real-time data from our truck sensors um, so that we can know exactly where the trucks are on the road, which, which, uh, which loads have been delivered to which customers. Um, we're starting to, uh, going forward, we're, and we're gonna be just doing more and more of that, I think we see in, uh, coming up, improving our ability for people to find data. So we do have 20 terabytes of data, so that the scale is at least a little interesting in terms of uh, working with the data that we have, but it also uh, can be challenging for, to, to work with and find the data sets you need, so improving our ability to, to show out of the 800 uh, diff different data sets we have, which ones are relevant to uh, different people's needs. Uh, says temperature-based data management. Again, uh, typically people don't need a full history of all the data. We do try to maintain that, but if we can accelerate and just provide the top uh, last three years of data, typically that's sufficient for the type of predictive an analytics that we have going on. Um, and also in terms of uh, the quality and the processes that we use, the production deployments, Again, I'm a little speaking more of the data engineer side here than the data scientist, but um, we're trying to take processes and make them repeatable, make them production ready, make sure that, they're, uh, that the deployments go smoothly and that we don't end up impacting uh, the various uh, consumers of the data who are, who are starting to use it as their lifeblood in the business. Um, Looks like we find working through the slides very challenging, but hopefully we got through it. Um, uh, in summary, um, if we really look at it, I think the platform that we built did, did three things for us. Um, we like to say it's faster, quicker, uh, cheaper, and better. Uh, what I mean by it's, it's faster. So traditionally, the appliance that, that we had uh, 
was very good at a specific use case, but it didn't do very well from a, a lot of unstructured or loosely coupled analysis, so we got through that. Uh, when we say it's uh, cheaper, I believe in something called uh, economy of architecture. You, we architect solutions for all kinds of different things. We architect them for scale, for performance. Uh, there is this opportunity for us to architect them for uh, cost. In this case, we run our biggest data flows for not more than $1 a month because that's how those high frequency pipeline cost. And then uh, this is how the whole ecosystem has evolved. So this is the platform, but what is in there for our data scientists, right? If you really look at it, uh, we allow experimentation at scale. So just transactions at Cisco, three years of data, it's about four billion rows. There's an opportunity that you can work with that data at that scale in a notebook environment. Um, some of our data scientists, they prefer a Hadoop cluster for anything more than 20 GB of data. Whereas some that think that you can put a data frame, uh, put it in R and then get the results that you need. You really don't have to have a theoretical conversation around it you can quickly experiment and check. And that's the beauty of the platform that, that we have. Uh, it scales with the user's need. You are able to do a lot of pre-production related jobs uh, at the level that you would need to, to be successful. And, and that's where we stand. And finally, as Greg said, uh, we are definitely looking for data engineers. So feel free to check out the, uh, the link out there and we can go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one question. Um, hi, I have a question. Um, so it was an interesting talk. Uh, in that seed uh, ecosystem, how straightforward was it for you to choose the various components of the, say, the AWS itself? Because I know AWS offers various uh, individual components. So how long did it take, and was it straightforward process? It, it wasn't straightforward, yes but we don't use all AWS. Uh, so our strategy has been use AWS where we can because the solutions have matured and, and replace that with, with other best of breed solutions that you have. Like in this case, you would have seen some other solutions for uh, ETL, what we call extract, load, and, and, and transform ELT, uh, we use Informatica for. From a selection perspective, I think uh, the way we approached it is uh, the good thing about cloud is you can experiment without really uh, having a long theoretical bias of where you want to go. If things don't work, you can just switch on and move on and do something else. So it took us about three to four months to even figure out what tools were relevant for us and what we wanted to use. Thank you.